Welcome to ISKCON of Silicon Valley. Today we have a triple header, starting with the continuation of His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu's series of two seminars. Yesterday we had spiritual solutions for modern problems. And today we have Bhagavad Gita as it was, Rethinking the Editing of Srila Prabhupada's Books. Radhika Raman Prabhu is a spiritual child prodigy, as well as an academic prodigy, <clears throat> who, in my humble opinion, Lord Chaitanya sent to show what it looks like to live a life in perfectly balanced Krishna consciousness. He's... <clears throat> Noted for his spiritual scholarship, even as a child, he wrote numerous essays that won international awards and wrote columns that inspired people worldwide, and even more so when they found out he was a mere child. He excelled in all aspects of his life, except for in basketball. <laughs> or any other sport, except for hiking, in which he's highly accomplished. And <laughs> he's well known around the world as a devotee who is f faithful to the Guru Parampara coming down to us through his Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. His own spiritual master, Srila Hanumat Prashek Swami, is a great scholar in his own right. He's very faithful. Radhika Raman Prabhu is faithfully served him over decades. And he comes here to ISKCON of Silicon Valley periodically, annually, I should say. And we're very happy to have you back here. Recently, <clears throat> Radhika Raman Prabhu, recently as four years ago, was selected by a plenary Porsche plenary meeting at Tirupati, which I attended in 2019, of the full body of BBT directors and trustees, along with the entire GBC body, who wanted to assemble a panel of devotees that would help to quell the anxieties of devotees around the world who didn't know much about the editing process of Srila Prabhupada's books, or many who thought they did but there wasn't as much clarity as there could have been. So together this group elected or recommended various scholarly types who knew Srila Prabhupada's books well, knew editing, knew writing, and were also known as solid devotees. So Radhika Raman Prabhu is one of those who had been chosen and he agreed to serve and had, has been for some years. So he'll be speaking today about something of which he knows much, which is the editing of Srila Prabhupada's books. And I'm sure he'll tell you more about his journey. But I'm very happy to have this topic here today because we distribute so many books. And then, of course, from time to time around the periphery, we may hear disparaging remarks about, oh, these books, why not some other books? So <clears throat> Radhi Karman Prabhu, for all of us, gathered here and online and from for years to come, because the recording is being made, right? <laughs> it's one of the main purposes, we want to get it on tape. Uh, we'll s speak to many of the concerns devotees have had, uh, reassuring us about the good intentions as well as practices of the devotees who have been engaged in editing Srila Prabhupada's books by his request over many, many decades. So thank you very much, everyone, for assembling here. Please give a very warm welcome to his guest, Radhika Raman Prabhu. Thank 
you so much, Vaishya Shikha Prabhu, as always, for the very, very kind, uh, generous introduction. Um, I, as Prabhu mentioned, I, I um, specifically wanted to give this presentation at ISV because all of you do such amazing service for Srila Prabhupada's books um, through their careful study and their wide distribution. And I've always felt that if I can do anything to serve those devotees who are distributing and studying Srila Prabhupada's books seriously and sincerely, then perhaps some benefit of that activity will come to me as well. And I too can please Srila Prabhupada in some capacity. So I sincerely hope that this presentation will be useful to um, all of you in your service and uh, to others who may be engaged similarly. So let's begin with a little bit of uh, Kirtan to start off with and to offer our respects to His Divine Grace. Yeah, 
हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हरे
Hare Krishna. So, um, welcome everyone, both in person and online. And thank you again for this opportunity to uh, say a few words about this topic. Uh, this, the, the title of the presentation is As It Was, Rethinking the Editing of Srila Prabhupada's Books. And um, thank you. As... Um, his Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu mentioned, this is a topic of um, considerable uh, thought and discussion and debate and argument uh, amongst devotees in Srila Prabhupada's movement. Uh, and for, I would say, the vast majority of people, it's not so much a matter of great controversy as it is of inquisitiveness and curiosity. Um, what is the journey? What is the story? What is the history of Srila Prabhupada's books? And how um, have they come to be where they're at? So I want to start off by um, just saying a little bit about my own positioning on the matter. Uh, because uh, having grown up 
in uh, the uh, Society of Devotees in ISKCON and having studied Prabhupada's books over the years, uh, this, um, this, is, this question never really was of much concern to me for many, many years. And over the years, devotees would ask me, well, what do you think about this editorial controversy? Or what do you think about how the editing happened? And my response was, I don't really think about it. And so I don't know what to think in this regard. It's not something that I've studied carefully. It's not something that I've thought about a lot. And, um, and when I haven't studied something and I haven't thought about it, then why have an opinion about it? Right? We often we're, we, we feel compelled to have an opinion about everything. But sometimes it's, it's good not to have an opinion, especially if we don't have a basis for that opinion, either in experience or in Shastric knowledge. Then why have an opinion? And so many times devotees had asked, can you speak about this topic? Do you have any, can you talk about it personally? And every time I'd kind of say, no, I, I just don't, I haven't thought about it really. Um, as Vaisheshika Prabhu mentioned a f some years ago, uh, this is now four years ago, um, I was asked to serve on this panel called the Editorial Review Panel, um, which was a panel that was brought together jointly by the Governing Body Commission of ISKCON and the trustees of the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust with the idea of going through all of the changes made to Srila Prabhupada's books over the years and to assess them in a sort of an independent way, as an, in, in an independent and, and uh, hopefully impartial way. When I um, uh, agreed to serve on that body, I didn't come to it with any preconceived notions about what was right or what was wrong in terms of the editing. Um, of course, we all have certain predilections coming from our background, right? Um, and from our, our own natures and so on. But as much as possible, trying to put those aside and think about, okay, if I were to think of this in as objective a way as, as possible, um, then what, how would we, how would we um, uh, pursue this service? And um, I would say even, I would say, um, if there was a predilection, it was very much towards the idea that we have to be very, very hesitant when we edit Prabhupada's books. Um, different members of the panel had different sort of backgrounds and opinions when we started off together. But mine was very much kind of tending towards hesitancy, caution, um, and uh, concern. And, um, and so uh, one of the first things that we did as a panel was we decided that before we could go in and just try to, uh, uh, you know, cast some judgment on this edit or that edit or go systematically and try to examine all of them, that we needed some kind of a basis for, from which to do that. What are the principles that we are going to try to follow um, in order to do our editing work? And what's the foundation of those principles? As in... Um, what are Srila Prabhupada's own desires and wishes for the process of editing. So we spent a good part of a year, maybe actually a little more than a year, um, working, uh, I was part of a subcommittee of the larger one that, whose goal it was to, to put together a set of principles that would guide our own work. Those principles were not meant to tell anyone else what to do, but really to say, what are, how are we going to go uh, about our work, and eventually when devotees want to know what we're doing, um, then what's the foundations of that? So we worked on those principles, and those principles are now published by the BBT and publicly available. And then we started on Bhagavad Gita as it is, uh, going through each one of those changes. And that has been going on for three years now, and we've made it through chapter seven of Bhagavad Gita. So it's a long process. There's sometimes we spend um, up to an hour debating a single change. And um, so we, we try to take it very seriously. And with a group of very thoughtful and, and meticulous devotees, uh, it can be slow going. Um, anytime any one of us uh, is um, 
concerned about a particular change, uh, we discuss it as a whole group, right? So those that none of us are concerned about, that seem you know, fine to all of us, we don't mark those, those go on. Um, and there are hundreds of such changes. And then if there's changes that uh, one of us is concerned about, or more than one of us, then we come together and we discuss it together as a panel in a live sort of format. And that takes some time. Um, the panel members, uh, besides myself, include Krishna Kshetra Swami, um, Bhanu Swami, Bhakti Vigyan Goswami, Keshava Bharati Goswami, Krishna Rupa Mataji, and Kala Chanji Prabhu. Um, and each one of these devotees has had a lot of experience um, either writing or editing uh, books themselves. Mm. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the overall picture. And now after four years of engaging in this, um, I thought it's time for me to... Now I can say something about this topic after having um, <laughs> uh, avoided that question or... Uh, uh, not participating at all for lack of knowledge, okay, now perhaps there's something that I can offer in this regard. So I wrote a full paper on this topic. Um, it's, it's gradually growing, but it's almost done, uh, putting the final touches on it and so on, about 10,000 words in length, which is kind of a largish journal article sort of length, which I hope to get published in an academic journal. Um, and this presentation is really founded on that larger paper uh, with an attempt to express it in ways that is more accessible for devotees <clears throat> and also um, uh, with it in ways that are relevant to the immediate concerns that many of us share. So that's kind of the background or the basis of what this presentation um, is all about. My attempt is to come at this question with uh, as much um, basis in uh, uh, academic reasoning and scholarly thought on the topic of editing of books in general. And this is why when we start out, I want to take a step back before we dive straight into the question of editing Prabhupada's books. Because one of the characteristics of scholarship is always to start with the larger context. To always say, what is the larger context within which we are raising this question? And what's the history of that that leads us to where we're at? Because without that larger context, then we can often get buried in the immediate controversies and issues that arise. And some of those controversies and issues then become very heavily focused on specific persons and personalities, and they tend to develop into even to ad hominem attacks, where they become attacks on particular individuals. And all of that is very much against the ethos of scholarship. Uh, whether it's modern e academic scholarship or it's traditional Vaishnav scholarship, the nature of scholarship in general is to set aside personal attacks and to talk about the issues and the challenges in, in general, the, the philosophy. Prabhupada would do this very often. Whenever he was asked the, his opinion about such and such Swami or guru or teacher, Prabhupada would say, I do not know who he is. Tell me what is his philosophy, right? And then he would respond to the philosophy rather than the person. Um, and, and that, I think, is a, is, is a quality of scholarship, but it's also a quality of Vaishnav behavior, where whenever we want to address something difficult or controversial, then instead of diving into it, you know, hands and feet and head first and just kind of swimming in it, we always try to take a step back and ask ourselves, how can I do this with some measure of, at least in the mode of goodness. Maybe we can't be transcendental right away, but at least in the mode of goodness. And that requires some separation between me and the immediate controversy that's happening. So, with that in mind, let's look at the picture um, as it is a little bit uh, um, bigger. That special side of, that special effect uh, was put in by my kids. I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> they, they put together my, so this is, uh, this is their contribution. Uh, they actually made this slideshow. I have to give them credit for that. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at what Vaishnav editorial practice has been in general. We get a book in our hands and that book is Shastra. Uh, it's Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, or whatever we have in our hands. And rarely do we need to think about the question of how did that book 
become what it is? How did the knowledge from Krishna speaking, not writing, speaking on a battlefield, end up in our hands in the 21st century in the form of a book? Uh, we're very lucky, we're fortunate that when someone asks us, what's the Bhagavad Gita, we can just point to it. Uh, because for centuries, people couldn't do that, right? So what goes into a book is something that we need to think about, and it's useful for this conversation. In ancient times, uh, in Vedic times, books were typically oral creations, not written creations. So sages would memorize and recite, uh, and as they recited, then also comment, and in this way teach it to their students, who would then also learn it and teach it onward. In this way, the parampara continued in oral ways for many, many years, for thousands of years. And this is a fact that writing was used very, very late, comparatively speaking. And the transmission of Vedic knowledge was through oral means. You can still see this and feel this in works like the Upanishads, where the teacher will, will say, my dear student or my dear son, this is temporary. And there's no indication of what this is. But the teacher delivering it orally is pointing to his own body or to the student's body and saying, this is temporary, right? So that's why then you need commentaries to explain that oral characteristic. Now, when a book is delivered orally and then it's written down, we tend to think of writing as an extremely stable affair. Like when something is written, then it's fixed, right? And there it is and so on. But in fact, writing is highly unstable. When the Vedas were transmitted orally, I mean the four Vedas, Rig, Yajur, Samana, Tarva, through memorization, their transmission the system of memorization was so precise, and there's a whole system which uh, I don't have time to get into, but it was so precise that it was transmitted practically perfectly. And that system of recitation today, orally, um, some scholars say is the closest thing we have to a 3,000-year-old tape recording. Uh, it's, it's amazing how precisely it was uh, um, uh, transmitted. And yet, when things are written down, often there are a lot of variations and instability in the writing. Why? Well, here's, um, here's one big reason. So as the author speaks, then either, or, or has the information in their mind, then either they're going to write it themselves, or probably more likely, they're going to get a scribe to write for them. Writing, unlike today, used to be an act of manual labor. So it was like you would hire a plumber, so you would hire a writer as well to, to physically write things down. And so you might find someone to write it down for you. And um, once that book is written, then in order to proliferate it, to spread the knowledge that you have written, you don't want it to be the only copy of the book, before the printing press, of course, what you have to do is you have to find other scribes who are willing to copy the book. Every time a copy is made, there are changes introduced. Most of these changes tend to be accidental in nature. Um, uh, when we copy something, and you can try this at home, try hand copying something that you are reading from one of Prabhupada's purports, and you'll find that you introduce plenty of mistakes. As you type, right, word attempts to correct our mistakes. Sometimes it corrects correctly, and sometimes it corrects incorrectly and we get all these garbled things, but it's very difficult to actually type accurately or to write accurately. When I was uh, studying the Sandarbhas uh, for my doctoral work, one of the things I did was to collect the different manuscripts of Jiva Goswami Sandarbhas. Manuscript means handwritten, um, before the times of the printing press, and compare them. And sure enough, enough, it was very obvious how certain manuscripts had been copied from others because there were differences and changes introduced. So uh, one manuscript, for example, would write a line of text, the scribe was writing, and then, in the and then in the next line, repeat something from the first line, and then apparently recognize the fact that he was repeating, and then go to the right place and continue writing again. And this would happen over and over again. And I was trying to figure out why this odd sort of thing um, until I discovered the manuscript from which he copied. And this was a manuscript that went like, 
um, the, the lines went like this at an angle. The person, the scribe couldn't write in a straight line, so it was kind of like this. And every time he would copy, he would go up and then to the next line, right? But what's the next line down? It's the beginning of that same line because it's at an angle. And so he would go down next line, start copying, and then realize uh, his mistake, and then go back to the, to the actual line he needed to. And the place where the repetition happened each time in this problematic copy was always the point at which the new line started in the other one. So I knew there was a direct copying relationship there. The, the unfortunate part is that the scribe never took the time to actually cross it out. Um, and so you can see the problem for someone who doesn't have a copy of Gopi Purana Dhanath Prabhu's Tattva Sandarbha, you can really get confused in terms of what's actually happening because you might think Jiva Goswami is repeating himself intentionally because sometimes scriptures do repeat themselves um, actually quite regularly. And so you might think that's happening or you might be confused and you don't know what that other manuscript is because the original manuscript from which it was copied may not only be far away, it might even be destroyed by this point. So changes like this that are inadvertent errors, mistakes of various kinds, do add up over time. The other thing that happens, which is not inadvertent, well, kind of is, but um, as people read these manuscripts, they make comments in the margins. And when they do that, then um, that's for their own thinking process. But also what happens is sometimes scribes skip a line or something accidentally. They'll fill that in in the margins. So when the next copier comes forward, they don't know in the margins, is that the reader's comments or is that something the previous scribe forgot and is actually Jiva Goswami's writing? So they might add a line into the text that wasn't supposed to be added, that wasn't Jiva Goswami's writing, it was someone else's thought. And in this way, the problems compound over the course of time. All of this so far is all well-intentioned. If you get one scribe who is not well-intentioned, as in is intentionally trying to change the words of the author because he doesn't agree with them, then you've got a big mess, right? Then you can have additional, you know, so on. So the reason I tell you all this is because what happens is over the course of time, these different versions proliferate and they be, can become so um, uh, different that you can get different recensions of a text, that is, different versions of a text, particularly when written and oral tradition combine with each other. One good example is the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is an oral text, as in it's usually recited and performed on stage, almost never read on paper, even to this day. There's so much variation in the Maha, different versions of the Mahabharata that between North and South Indian versions, you have totally different stories sometimes or important differences in, in, the, in the aspects of the stories, probably because someone was reciting and embellishing on their own um, as, as sort of a commentary, a running commentary. But whoever was then writing didn't recognize it as commentary and included it in the text, right? So a variety of reasons might happen, but you have sometimes very different versions. This fact that I'm describing you is not some, it's, it's not only a modern recognition of the problems of textual transmission. This recognition exists even in uh, ancient times, both in ancient India and in ancient Greece and Rome. People were very aware of this fact. We are not the first people. In fact, we are probably more unaware than people were before because of the rise of the printing press, right? People were, were very aware of the fact that manuscripts can have these problems. And this is why, for example, um, Madhvacharya wrote a work called Bharata Tatparya Nirnaya, Mahabharata Tatparya Nirnaya, which is his commentary uh, essay on Mahabharata. And he starts off by saying the Mahabharata is the culmination of all scriptures. It is so wonderful and amazing and worth reading. And then he says, but today it is practically in ruins because of this problem of textual transmission. And he attempts then, he offers a reading of the Mahabharata that is appropriate 
for the text itself by saying, this is the correct understanding of the work. And a side note, this is a very important reason why we need parampara, why we need disciplic succession. Because it is disciplic succession that preserves and constantly purifies a text as it is gradually um, changing or decaying just by the course of history itself and just by the course of human hands. <laughs> so this happens, and, and the Acharyas are aware of this. So often in the commentaries on Srimad Bhagavatam also, um, are, the Acharyas will say, Patantara, here's another reading of this verse, another version of this verse. They'll comment on the first version, and if the second version is acceptable to them, they'll comment on that second one as well. Uh, before we move on, just to allay any fears, Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita are extremely stable texts. Okay? The, the differences in uh, Bhagavatam across manuscripts are so minuscule compared to the size of the text so as to be practically negligible. Um, there are some variations, and our Acharyas will note those variations in their commentaries, but it's not anything that would shatter anyone's world in terms of, uh, you know, what, is Krishna the Supreme Personality of Godhead or not, <laughs> right? That's, that's not going to happen. And Bhagavad Gita, it's even more stable primarily because there are thousands and thousands of people over the centuries, uh, millions, who have memorized the Bhagavad Gita, or different chapters of it, right? So this is another reason for us to regularly engage in the practice of reading, studying, chanting, memorizing, and distributing these sacred literatures because it ensures their preservation over time. The texts that really struggle are the ones that are not very well read. They end up um, very quickly dying over time because no one knows what the original text is and pretty soon people even lose what examples they have of it. So our Acharyas are very aware of this. Perhaps the original example of this problem comes from uh, Krishna himself in Bhagavad Gita where he says, evam parampara praptam imam rajar shayo vidu sa kale neha mahata yogo nashta parantapa. Over time, Krishna says, this was handed down through disciplic succession, but over time, that knowledge as it is appears to have been lost. Yogo nashta. Therefore, sa evaya mayatedya yoga prokta puratana. That same knowledge I'm now giving to you again here. I'm reestablishing. Sometimes a text becomes so badly changed over time. Or in this case, the message is misinterpreted over time that Krishna himself has to intervene to establish it again. This thinking process, which I went through for Jiva Goswami's Paramatma Sandarbha, doing is called a, creating a critical edition of a text. It's called critical editing or scholarly editing of a text. And it's something that today has been developed into a great science um, that has all kinds of systematic rules for how is it that you can determine what the original reading of a text was. You can never be 100% sure, never. It's always something of a subjective decision. But we can make it less subjective by following certain standards and by recognizing that certain patterns hold over time. Um, now, that's just in ancient times. Now come to the modern world. The printing press is here, and we can print a million copies of the same work exactly the same. So, problem solved, right? No. Even today, a text is still an unstable thing. Why? Well, we have our own set of challenges, which is as follows. An author writes a work, and then, um, usually these days, by computer, although not too long ago, that was by typewriter, uh, which had its own set of problems, and before that, um, in other ways. But even, let's say, computer typing, right? As the author writes, there are certain... The author is trying to convey his or her um, ideas as accurately as possible. Certain challenges are involved there. One is simple acts of mistyping, 
you just type incorrectly. This happens all the time, um, at least to me, but I think for most people. And then secondly, you, um, as you're uh, trying to express, you express, you try to say something, but you use the wrong word for it or the wrong phrasing or it's grammatically incorrect. This is why every work published today by respectable publishers goes through a process of editing of those books, right? Now, when the editor is sitting down to edit those books, the editor has two goals. One is to make the ideas as clear and accurate as possible and to be as faithful as possible to what the author intended. If you can't do this balancing act, then you're not a very good editor, right? Basically, if you're trying to make it really perfect, but in the process you lose the point the author was going to say, well, now you've got a problem. If you're trying to keep the point of the author, but you can't clean it up, either for checking a f accuracy of a uh, facts is something typical uh, academic publishers do, do these days, or grammatical accuracy, or uh, a clarity, uh, you're, you're, I, I kind of see what you're trying to say. My um, editor will say, with whatever academic press I'm publishing, say, I, I, I see what you're trying to say here, uh, but it doesn't quite come across. Um, you, you need to say this a little bit differently, right? This is a typical process of editing that takes place. After that editing is done, it goes back to the author for another careful read to ensure that the editor didn't do anything wrong in that scenario. <clears throat> The author hopefully checks everything by reading the whole thing. At that point, it goes to a copy editor. And a copy editor's goal is not to fix ideas or clarity or accuracy of facts or so on, but simply to ensure that things are uh, consistent, that when you write the word drama, you've always got a line over the A, right? Um, and to ensure that there's no um, uh, uh, basic grammatical issues, typos, uh, formatting matters, uh, citations and references and that kind of thing. Then once that, yeah, and then it's laid out into proofs and then it goes back again to the author because the copy editor could have introduced mistakes just like the previous editor could have. And this has happened to me also several times. A copy editor once went through and changed the diacritics on some key word. It wasn't Krishna, but it was something else. All through the book, right? Every S with a dot under it was replaced with an S with a line on top. Oh my gosh. And I had to go through the whole thing and correct every single instance by hand. And you send it back to the copy editor or, uh, or by hand or, or on the screen. You send it back and they again input it. And at that point, you don't get to see it anymore. They just publish, okay? So this is a pretty typical process of what an academic book goes through. And at every one of those stages, mistakes can be introduced, despite the attempts to prevent that. <coughs> so there you have it. And then when it's published, if there are still mistakes, then publishers will often slip in a note uh, that says errata on it, and they'll list all the mistakes that have still slipped by. Or if they're significant enough where people are misunderstanding the work, then authors, or there's new data or new information, authors will typically publish a revised edition. Now you have two versions of the same text that often show a shift in understanding from the side of the author or from the side of the publisher. So, the written word the book as we have it, goes through a long process of shifts and turns and so on. And this process on the, uh, in the oral culture of India is very well known in our tradition, very carefully noted by such respectable devotees and scholars as have appeared in our line of Acharyas. In fact, Srila Jiva Goswami, Rupa Goswami himself, so one of Jiva Goswami's first services in relation to Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami when he arrived in Vrindavan was to serve as the editor for the books of uh, Srila Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami. Jiva Goswami uh, was the one who helped edit, uh, not helped, he did edit the Nectar Devotion, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Um, and he also wrote a commentary on it, but he also edited the text itself. Um, he also edited Brihad Bhagavatamrita, 
and his writing of the Sandarbhas also, Jiva Goswami starts every Sandarbha by a verse in which he says, Dakshinatyena Bhattena. This book was originally compiled by, um, uh, by one Bhatta from South India. Uh, which we understand to be Gopal Bhatta Goswami. But the problem is, whatever work that was, Kranta Vyut Kranta Khanditam. Now the pages of that are all messed up. They're all out of order, and they're all confused, and people have copied and miscopied. Khanditam. And the book is broken. So now, Parya Lochyata Paryayam. Now I'm going to try to fix it and clean it up. So Jiva Goswami also is very aware of the challenges that come with this. And in fact, through, and then the, the finer editing that he did for the older Goswamis, there are letters in Bhakti Ratnakara uh, that talk about how, you know that first shipment um, that uh, was sent by Jiva Goswami th with Srinivas Acharya and Shamananda uh, Pandit and Ranurutam Das Thakur to Bengal, uh, it seems that Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Nectar Devotion, was not included in that first shipment um, because Jiva Goswami was still finishing the editing of that work. And he continued the editorial process even after the departure. By that time, Rupa and Sanatan Goswami had left this world. He continued editing uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, um, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, and Vaishnava Toshini, I think, as well, was on that list. Um, so many of the key works that you v we value very much um, uh, received the editorial attention and care of Srila Jiva Goswami, uh, both during the time of their authors' lives and afterwards as well. So there was apparently a second shipment of books uh, that contained all those valuable treasures um, that we like to read, we enjoy reading. So this is a little bit of a history of what we might call textual criticism. I know the word criticism is a negative word within the community of devotees, so please forgive me for using it here. The, the word here does not refer to anyone criticizing their, the acharyas or their superiors. No, 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 no. Here the word criticism refers particularly to this process of thinking, what did um, the acharya actually write? And that recovery of the words of the Acharya is the heart of the meaning of the word Arsha Prayoga. Right? This word maybe you've heard before, Arsha Prayoga. Arsha Prayoga means the usage of the great sages. What is their words? What is their original words? And whatever their original words are and their original intention is must be preserved, even if it doesn't look right to us even if it doesn't, we don't agree with it, or there's something odd or outdated about the nature of those. It, it must be preserved. And trying to recover that original authorial intention is the very heart of what is the process of textual criticism. So like I said, textual criticism is a very developed science. In the last century, it's very, very nicely developed. There's a lot of sources about it that you can study and how best to do it and so on. Um, that process has one goal, which is how do we recover the author's original intent? What they actually intended. Because authors don't always even express their own intent clearly. Sometimes they do, and sometimes there's typos, and sometimes there's... So, anyway. So that's, that's a brief history of Vaishnav editorial practice, as well as the practice of textual criticism that has a long history both within our tradition and in the modern world as well. Now, fast forwarding, we come to the time of Srila Prabhupada. 5,000 years ago, Srila Vyasadeva composed these amazing literatures, including Srimad Bhagavatam, for the benefit of the world. 500 years ago, Srila Jiva Goswami, Srila Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan wrote a million verses in Sanskrit, taking that knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam and putting it into the form of poetry and argumentation and philosophy, again, for all of our benefits. 125 years ago, Srila Prabhupada appeared in this world. And in his uh, later years, began the process of writing and commenting upon his life's work, Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. 
through that process of Prabhupada's writing. That's something that we want to look at in the modern world, what happens when Prabhupada writes his works. So the first thing to note is that, literally speaking, Prabhupada didn't write his books. He spoke them. Okay? This is something that's not... Okay, there's a few chapters of Bhagavad Gita that he actually typed himself. But outside those chapters, most of what he did, he spoke. This is not, as we should be able to see at this point, this is not just a, um, a, a, an interesting fact on the side. It's actually crucial to the question of editing. It's not crucial to the question of what Prabhupada's message is. Uh, that we know quite clearly. But in terms of the editing process, as we've seen through this charting of history, that's actually really important, the fact that he spoke his books, typically into a dictaphone, a machine called a dictaphone. And after he did that, those spoken words then went to, through a, a very um, complex process of production. Um, someone would type those out, create a transcript of them. Then it would go to an editor who would fix it for issues of grammar and spelling and uh, issues of, of clarity or confusions of various kinds, things that had been interchanged or so on. Um, and then it would go to a Sanskrit editor who would correct all the Sanskrit, the diacritic marks, make sure that the word-for-word -word meanings were accurate um, on the spot. Sometimes Prabhupada would do the word-for-word -word meanings. Sometimes he would leave them for his Sanskrit editors to provide the word-for-word. -word. And then it would go again to an English editor to do a full edit and to do a copy edit of the whole thing. Um, it would go to artists who would illustrate them in various forms. Um, and then it would go to layout and, and, um, and actually be published. That whole process, from Prabhupada speaking it to um, the actual published book in the hands, um, Prabhupada had very little involvement, directly speaking, in each of those steps after he dictated um, the, uh, the books themselves. Um, so this is... Um, so th th this, is, this is sometimes seen as a controversial point, okay? But the reality is that if you do a systematic study of the history, that is, you look at all the written things Prabhupada said it about, edi about editing, which our panel did. We went through everything Prabhupada wrote in his letters. Um, he spoke in his conversations. A lot of memories from devotees who engage in this editorial process we find that with a few exceptions, Prabhupada was not closely involved in that process. He, he spoke in the dictaphone, and then he trusted his editors, his producers, his artists, and so on, to see the book in the finished state. And then when devotees handed him the copy, uh, Prabhupada was always delighted and very proud to receive this book in his hands. Um, of the thousands of letters that Prabhupada wrote, there's about a hundred that deal with editing. Um, and those hundred themselves are usually one or two sentences about editing. He's men mentioning this one point or correcting this one mistake and so on. Um, out of the conversations Prabhupada give, hundreds of hours, there's a handful of conversations. I don't remember the exact number, maybe a dozen or something like that, where Prabhupada actually speaks something connected to editing. And those letters or conversations that are actually lengthy, detailed topic uh, dealing with editing are very, very few in number. Um, there were many different reasons for this, but the most important reason was that Prabhupada was traveling all around the world. His time for writing was in the mornings, and he was managing a global movement. His primary uh, concern was urgency. These books need to get out into the world, and you do the needful to make sure that they're published. At the same time, Prabhupada was very concerned about the fact that these books be edited uh, correctly and uh, be done in a polished way because he wanted his books to be read and studied in colleges and universities. Whenever professors used to come visit him, the first thing he'd do is bring out his books and give them copies, show them copies, sometimes read out loud to them. Um, Prabhupada was putting his editors under immense pressure uh, to uh, sometimes giving them uh, a, a time limit, like, um, you know, the famous Chaitanya Chaitamrita <laughs> marathon. But even otherwise, that was, that was a real extreme case. But there were other times also, usually Prabhupada's 
uh, uh, one of his most common instruction to his editors was, do this quickly, right? And he would sometimes give them quotas. In one letter he says, 30 pages daily to the editor. This is what you need to get through, 30 pages every day, to the transcribers um, and to the publishers, that you're not able to keep up with me, even though I'm producing all these books and you, you can't do it. I'm writing and you can't even publish them in time. So, and at other times, he would insist that they be done very well. Uh, often, when he was reading the books himself, or someone was reading to him, he'd stop and he'd correct something. He did this sometimes in public lectures. Uh, there's an instance where the, uh, someone was reading the story of Ajamila, and it says that Ajamil ca called out, O Narayana, three times. And Prabhupada said, what is this three times? He just called once. He didn't need to call out three times. And he corrected that text, the editing uh, of that. Other times he would uh, write in a letter saying, um, in the Krishna book, he said, I don't know what this word budbhavasa is. Uh, this is a new word. Why didn't my Sanskrit editor catch the fact that this is a non-existent word? The right word is purbhavaswaha. But apparently, whoever was listening to the tape couldn't understand Prabhupada saying purbhavaswaha and instead wrote budbhavasa instead. Right? So Prabhupada would catch things like this. The only text that I can tell um, from reading his literatures and, 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 and his letters and conversations, that Prabhupada actually did a close line-by-line -line read in the way that authors do today was Easy Journey to Other Planets. That was a very early work that Prabhupada produced, and he gives line-by-line -line corrections on many sections of it. And he says, this needs to be fixed and that needs to be fixed. But most of the time, when consulted, he would answer questions for the editors. Now, that being the case... You can imagine that in the editorial process, which is anyway, as we've discussed, prone to human error, uh, the types of errors that would emerge in that process. What kinds? Well, one, errors related to speed. When someone is trying to type really fast and do things quickly in editing, you're going to miss things that should be edited and not edit those. Other things, you edit a little too um, enthusiastically and change, miss a nuance of what Prabhupada was trying to say. Another issue that emerges is one of Prabhupada's accent. And this is a question that actually the devotees brought to Srila Prabhupada at one point. Uh, there's a conversation where they tell him, um, the transcribers are having a tough time understanding your accent on the recorded tapes. Um, this we can understand when people become devotees for the first time and they start listening to Prabhupada's lectures, it can take a while before they're able to catch many of the words, right? So especially when the Sanskrit words happen, because remember, these transcribers were in the beginning unfamiliar, in the beginning of their service, not just in the beginning of the movement. A new transcriber was unfamiliar with Prabhupada's accent and unfamiliar with the Sanskrit, right? So you've got a double problem here, which turns Purbhuvaswa into Budbhuvasa, because you don't hear the accent properly, and then... So they, they asked Prabhupada this question about, you know, the accent, and, and Prabhupada discussed, and, and there was nothing really that could be done about the situation. The conversation kind of just ends, because, well, Prabhupada wanted these to come out quickly, and the, the, uh, the, the transcribers just needed to do the best they could. Then there were various kinds of issues with understanding of the philosophy uh, as well, um, which is um, at the beginning, at that time, the editors had a limited understanding of the larger philosophy of Krishna consciousness and of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, as well as a limited understanding of the Sanskrit. So sometimes there was dis distinctions in theology and so on. We'll get into those details later. But it suffice it to say that because of the unique process that Prabhupada used for the editing of his books, there were a variety of different challenges or um, editorial difficulties that emerged. Prabhupada himself was aware of this fact. And in 1977, a few months before his departure, there's a very famous and controversial conversation, controversial in terms of interpretation, um, a conversation that Prabhupada had with um, his, with several s senior devotees, including editors and publishers, saying, um, uh, what is this? Uh, what's, what's happening here? Why are the editors not editing properly? 
right? It's, this is the famous rascal editor's conversation because Prabhupada uses that term, rascal. Um, and, <laughs> he, um, and it has to do with the fact that there's a, ver there's a word, munaya uh, sadhu prishtoham, a very famous verse at the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. The word munaya is taken as the sages, when in fact it needs, it's actually a vocative word in Sanskrit meaning, oh, sages. It's the same word, but it can be understood in two different ways in the Sanskrit. And Prabhupada, they chose the wrong one, and Prabhupada was upset. Why isn't the editing happening properly? And that led to a broader discussion, and then a determination at the end of that, saying um, all his books should be reviewed by the editors, again, to ensure their accuracy. Um, uh, that plan was made. Prabhupada departed about two or three, no, four, four months after that. This was in June. Prabhupada departed in November. And, um, and the editing, the whole review of his books was still left to be done. And so the BBT embarked on a process of thorough editing of his books that involved hundreds of minor and sometimes more significant edits. Practically, from the beginning of that process, there was controversy amongst devotees within the movement. Um, people asking why that editing was happening at all. People asking why that editing was happening after Prabhupada's departure. Uh, people asking even if that editing needed to happen, why were certain edits taking place? Was it being over-edited or not edited enough? There was all kinds of controversies, and those controversies have not dissipated. They've continued over time into our present day. And often that discussion becomes very uh, angry, vitriolic discussions that tend not to be on the level of real reason, thought, and debate, and more personal attacks uh, in ways that are very un and unscholarly at the same time. Okay, so this is the story. Okay, this is the big story. We'll get, we'll, we'll get into details in just a minute, but here's, here's the picture, and it's really important to understand that larger picture, because otherwise you pick up one book or you pick up one edit out of context, and it, there's no way to make sense of it. Okay, so with that... Um, uh, Okay, I, I actually already did this slide, but yeah, so there was the long debate, right, that I described, um, and then the editorial review panel was created with an attempt to try to say, okay, if there can be a, some party that is removed from the editorial process itself, so it's not the editors who are deciding the validity of their own edits, it's not the publishers who are deciding the validity of the publish of the edit editor's edits, that there's another body that's neither part of the BBT um, uh, or the editorial, uh, the editors themselves, to review that, then maybe that will help. Okay, so I already told you about the editorial um, review panel. All right. So in the debates that have taken place since then, so the current debates that are taking place, um, as far as um, I have been able to tell, there seems to be three key questions that the two sides. There's more than two sides, okay? There's multiple, there's devotees in every spectrum. Some who say no changes should be made, period, like it's over. And others who say no, editing must happen and it's not being properly edited enough and everyone in between, right? So there's a full range. But if we kind of think of two sides just for the sake of teaching here, just for the sake of argument, right? Those who are um, upset about changes or hesitant about changes and those who are more willing, then there seem to be three key questions or issues at stake um, that both sides uh, debate, okay? Um, the first one, and I'm sorry, this is a little small here. Um, I'll, I'll read it out for you. The first question is, when we make editorial changes, are we correcting Prabhupada's own work or the work of previous editors? Do we preserve Srila Prabhupada's words or his voice by not editing or by thoroughly editing? You see the question? Whose words are you changing? The BBT editors feel 
what we are doing is recovering Srila Prabhupada's voice from the problems and changes and mistakes introduced by prior editors or by the mistakes that the prior editors failed to correct or catch, the edits that they failed to do. Those who are the BBT's critics argue that um, the, the books published during Prabhupada's time are Prabhupada's voice. That's what he wrote. See, there's Prabhupada's signature on the contract for publishing this book. He wanted this book published, and it was this book he wanted published. This is his voice. And every time you change something, you are moving away, or potentially moving away, from Prabhupada's own words. The second question, which version of the text best represents Srila Prabhupada's authorial intention, what he intended to convey? Which book best represents his voice? Is it the earliest manuscripts we have? Or is it the latest edition that was approved and printed in Prabhupada's lifetime? By the earliest transcripts, I mean for some books, like Bhagavad Gita, uh, as it is, we've the first six or seven chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, we have Prabhupada's own typewritten text, um, the, the, the manuscript that he was typing originally himself. For other chapters of the Gita, we have, um, or other books, we have the first transcripts of what Prabhupada dictated. For very few, like Krishna book, we actually have his dictation. Uh, you can listen to it online, it's very beautiful. Um, but for most, we don't have that. We have the first uh, transcription by a typist. And for some, we have not even the first transcription, but we have the first round of editing that was done. On it, the first cleanup, which tended to be like a very basic sort of cleanup. Anyway, so those collectively, uh, the BBT refers to as uh, the OT or the original transcripts, but not all of them are transcripts. Some are type text, some are manuscripts, and so on and so forth. But is it that, that early material that best represents Prabhupada's intention that we need to convey? Or is it what the author actually published during his lifetime? Um, as we'll see, the answer really lies somewhere in between. Um, like with most things, uh, the, the, the right answer is rarely, rarely on the extremes. Um, this is Lord Buddha's, one of his great contributions to the world was the idea of the middle way, right? This is described in, in Bhagavad Gita also by Krishna. Yuktahara viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta svapnava bhodasya yogo bhavati dukkaha. Krishna says balance in all matters of eating, sleeping, recreation. That's the path of the yogi. And Lord Buddha says something very similar about the middle way. That most often the truth can be found or at least approximated somewhere in the middle. And when you're dealing with extremes on either end, we ought to be fairly suspicious about that. Um, the third question is, is there a difference, uh, sorry, is there a difference between editing Srila Prabhupada's books during his lifetime and editing done after his lifetime? Now, um, I would say, uh, just as a very basic answer, everyone agrees that there is a difference. But to what extent is there a difference? Uh, the BBT says um, that if the editing is done in the same way it was done during his lifetime, by the same people who were approved to edit during his lifetime, then there's not much of a difference. But after uh, Prabhupada's uh, after the departure of those devotees who were editing during Prabhupada's lifetime, then yes, there would be a difference. Um, the, B the BBT's critics feel that there's definitely a difference. Uh, once the author leaves, something changes. Namely, you would no longer have the ability to consult the author on changes. And number two, the author has lost his ability to object to any changes that are being made even as obvious as they may seem. So as you can see, and as I hope I, I can convey um, in as impartial a way as possible, is to say there's a reasonable argument on both sides, right? Like if we stay away from the extremes and if we're not doing personal ad hominem attacks, 
then if we're thinking of this in a, in a reasonable manner, there's actually, you can see how a thoughtful person might end up on either side of these questions, right? Might end up answering these questions in one way or the other, or somewhere in the middle. Which is why the problem is so significant. This is why it requires thought. If the answer were obvious, then no one, except those, you know, who, like unreasonable people, no one really would debate about this. But so many devotees do because of the fact that these are, first of all, really important questions for what is, you know, Prabhupada's words are Shastra for us. We receive spiritual knowledge through them, so it matters. And not only does it matter, but these questions are crucial. Okay. Now, most of the time, what happens is we end up trying to argue on one side of these questions or another. Um, can we edit? Can we not edit? Before his lifetime, after his lifetime, etc., etc. What I want to offer is something a little bit different than trying to stake a position on each of these questions. Although by the end of this talk, you might um, find some resolutions to these questions as well. These are not the questions I'm interested in right now. What I'm interested in presenting is, um, again, like academics are wont to do, take a step back and ask something more fundamental. What do we mean by editing? The BBT and the BBT's critics both use the word editing, and both mean something very different by it. Not only do they mean something different by it, but a lot of people who use the word editing don't recognize what they mean by that word. They may not know, recognize that question themselves. So here's an attempt to try to clarify it. Editing comes in two senses, okay, at least. One is the commonplace sense of editing. This is the sense that I described earlier. An author writes a book, it goes to an editor, the editor fixes grammar, spelling, um, issues of clarity, uh, this is not clear what you're saying, um, checks for uh, facts, errors of fact, right? Um, all of that sort of stuff sends it back to the author, the author goes through it again, then it goes back to an editor, a copy editor looks through it, etc. That process, okay? That's how we typically think of the word editing. But we've already seen that there is another sense of the term editing, which is um, textual criticism, or what we might call critical editing, or scholarly editing. This process takes place when it is not entirely clear what version of this text is best representing the author's intent. Or shall we say, a different way of putting it, as the text changes over time, then to try to attempt to decide which version of the text is closest to what the author himself wrote. Mm. Now, I've already described this critical editing process, but the question that we haven't discussed is this one, which is, what need is there for a critical edition when we have the author's own approved copy? The author read a book, wrote a book, it was edited, the author published the book, the author's signature's on it. Why do we need a critical edition? Maybe you need it for a work by Jiva Goswami, where we don't have what Jiva Goswami originally wrote. We don't have what Rupa Goswami's original manuscript was. There's a few small shreds in the Vrindavan Research Institute, which are beautiful and wonderful, but we don't have the full work, right? So, but in this case, we do, right? We have Prabhupada's own approved copy that was published, Prabhupada read from it, he heard from it, and the millions of copies were distributed. And the answer is, there's often a need still for a critical edition. In fact, many critical editions today, I'm not speaking of an ISKCON, but many critical editions done today are done when we do have the author's own approved copy because of these problems that I described earlier. When an author writes a work, because of the number of hands it goes through, editors, proofreaders, typists, artists, you know, compilers, designers, and so on, 
there are mistakes that are introduced in the work, even in multiple editions of it. I have read math textbooks in their eighth edition that still have errors in formulas um, that are key for the, 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 the readers themselves. So it's, these things can happen, but especially in a scenario where the author never looks at the book or rarely looks at the book before it is published. Right? And that particular scenario, the unique way in which Prabhupada published his, uh, wrote his books, creates a particular need to extract the editor's thinking and process from Prabhupada's, to separate the two and to figure out when did the editors go too far or not go far enough. And so um, it's particularly this unique process of Prabhupada dictating and then not carefully reading it line by line as most academic authors do today, that has led to a variety of different versions over time. Some even during Prabhupada's time, so the abridged edition of Bhagavad Gita as it is, the 1975 Macmillan, 1972 Macmillan edition, there was a 1975 edition as well, also still in Prabhupada's lifetime, that had important differences from 1972. All of those happening and certain edits on the first canto, for example, done during a thorough edit of the first canto done during Srila Prabhupada's lifetime as well, right? So when you've got multiple versions in the author's lifetime done by an author who's not reading it line by line, done by editors who are at varying capacities of understanding of the subject matter and varying capacities of skill in editing, then you've got a recipe for a lot of confusion, okay? And um, there were times when Prabhupada let go of his editors or changed editors or lost confidence in them, right? So there's also different editorial hands that take place. This is exactly the situation when critical editions are useful, where textual criticism is so important. And let me emphasize again that textual criticism is not someone just sitting there going, ah, this one, nah, this one, ah, yeah, I like this. It's not that, I promise. Yes, there's subjectivity involved, but there's certain very clear standards for how this is done. Okay, so now the fun part, which is um, to talk about the actual changes um, themselves and what's been done. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, so when you critically edit a word, work, the first thing you have to do is select a copy text. That is a, a a, one version that you're going to start with. Okay? So say you have four versions of a text, and you're trying to decide between the four versions there are some changes. Okay? And you're going to mark what those changes are. What's the basic version that you're going to begin with upon which those changes are going to ma be made? That's the first question. The answer to that question in critical editing is typically the version published and approved by the author is the version you start with. Okay? You could argue that the version you want to start with is the author's first draft. But that's not typically acceptable because the author intends to have it edited before publication, right? So you've lost something of the author's intent by going back to the very first version. You can't also take the latest version published as the author's intent because of the problem that someone may have introduced changes in the meantime. So neither version is completely acceptable, but the place to begin is typically the author's published edition, okay? So, in terms of what the BBT has done, the, the first thing to note is that the BBT began, the editorial, um, the editors began with the 1972 Macmillan edition of the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So, this is one thing to note, which is, if you look at Prabhupada's original transcripts or manuscripts of the Gita, and you look at the 1983 edition, which is the revised edition, the 1983 edition is much closer to the 1972 than it is to the original transcripts. The original transcripts involve so many things that need to be edited, 
so many English and grammar mistakes and other kinds of mistakes that going back to the original transcript would be a process of entirely doing the new thing, right? That shift from the original transcript to 72 was desired by Prabhupada. He wanted that to happen. And it's very important that that editorial process be honored, respected, and preserved. One aside that doesn't have to do with the flow of the argument here. One of the great pleasures of serving on the editorial review panel, well, there's been two great pleasures. One is the association of devotees who are on there, which are wonderful devotees. And to be able to read Prabhupada's books closely in the company of such devotees has been so wonderful for the past four years. Um, especially, we were convened for the first time in January of, of 2020. Um, and you know what happened in March of 2020. This was, in hindsight, the best way to spend your pandemic, is to, because you don't have to meet in person, and it's not a big program, you get together with devotees who are really wonderful and read Prabhupada's books closely. So that was one great joy. The other great joy was reading the original transcripts. Um, there's something, there was something very special about hearing Prabhupada's voice there and his, his, his words and his way of expressing that recalled Prabhupada's manner of giving lectures and classes. If you hear Prabhupada regularly in his lectures, the, the certain idioms that he has and the manner of speaking and his usage of particular words and how he puts things together how he constructs a sentence. Um, there's a rhythm to it, and you get to know a person's voice by listening to them. That voice you can hear in the original transcripts. They're really, really wonderful, very sweet. Um, uh, it feels like you're there in the room as Prabhupada is dictating uh, his books. So anyway, it was a wonderful experience. But as sweet as those OT, uh, those original transcripts are, the reality is Prabhupada wanted them edited and, um, and uh, cl uh, cleaned up in significant ways in 1972, by and large did a very good job of that. So 1972 editors, if you look at the volume of changes they're making from the OT, it is massive, it's significant. And their work was, for the most part, incredible. It was really, really well done. So this is where, this is the, the copy text, the base text that you start off with, okay? Then, when the copy text was changed by the 1983 editors, the Bhagavad Gita we have now, when it was changed, it was almost always done in response to variant readings. Variant readings means um, another version found in earlier transcripts. Okay? So Prabhupada said X in the original transcript, either through dictation or through typing, and 1972 says Y, and X and Y don't quite match, so a change was introduced to bring 83 closer to X. Um, so that was the, A72 was the copy text, which means 95% of what was in 72 was expect, accepted in 83. That's not an exact number, but it's the vast majority. And then, um, and then changes were... Um, uh, uh, introduced when there was a variant reading, sometimes from the original transcript and sometimes from earlier published versions. And finally, in cases when that happened, um, a revised or reconstructed text was offered that ref better reflected the original meaning, but stayed as close to the wording of 1972 as possible. This is crucial because the 1972 Macmillan edition of the Gita um, did a lot of English editing, and going back to the wording of the OT would have really introduced other problems. So the idea is to recover some of the intention from the original transcript, but maintain the wording of 1972 as much as possible. Okay, now, this is actually uh, the fun part I was referring to, okay, which is some real examples of what was actually done. Every one of the examples that I'm going to give you are... Um, th the reason I give you that example is because it is a sample of a very typical a type of edit made in the creation of a scholarly edition of a work. Okay? It's, a, it's, it's representative of a category of change. I could give you hundreds of examples, but that's not the point here. Um, I'm not trying to to explain this by volume of argument. That's, 
not possible, not in the space of, of our presentation, but really uh, to give you some type. Uh, and the, each of these types is really typical. Okay, so these will go relatively quickly. So the first category is errors introduced due to unclear language in the author's manuscript. Okay, so the editors, there's unclear language, and the editor is trying to decide what that means, and they end up choosing the wrong one. So um, this is uh, Bhagavad Gita 2.19. I'm sorry, I didn't put the verse up there. But Prabhupada says in the purport, because the spirit soul is so small that it is impossible to kill him by any material weapon, as it will evident from the foregoing verses. Okay, so as it will be evident from the foregoing verses. So it will be evident means it's yet to come. Foregoing means before. So it will be evident from the verses that already came. Clearly there's something unclear here, right? There's a, there's a, clearly there's something unclear. Okay, there's a problem. So 1972 editors said, the spirit soul is so small that it is impossible to kill him by any material weapon, as is evident from the previous verses. So they had to choose one, and which one did they choose? Forgoing, the ones that were previous. The fact of the matter is that the verse where Krishna says the living entity cannot be killed by any weapons, nainam chinanti shastrani, nainam dhati pavaka, is 223. It comes three or four verses after the one we're working on. So... Uh, 83 says, the spirit soul is so small that it is impossible to kill him by any weapon, as will be evident from subsequent verses. Okay? So this is an error introduced because the author's own intent is not conveyed clearly in the author's own manuscript. Other, another kind of error is errors introduced due to misunderstandings of theology and of Sanskrit on the part of the editors. So Srila Prabhupada's manuscript translates this beautiful verse by Madhavendra Puri, where he is um, addressing uh, uh, the daily practices of a Brahman. And this is a verse you can look up, it's a wonderful one. Sandhya Vandanamastubho, like that he calls. He says, Oh, my prayers three times a day, his three daily prayers. All glory to you. Oh, bathing, I offer my obeisances unto you. Oh, the demigods, oh, the forefathers, please excuse me for my inability to offer you my respects. Why is he unable? Because his heart is too much captured by Krishna and he can't be bothered with the rituals of uh, the Brahminical life. So he's, he's calling out, he's worshipping his prayers and his bathing. And uh, 1972 says, O oh Lord, in my prayers, three times a day, all glory to you. While bathing, or bathing, I offer my obeisances unto you. So it was in, in, inconceivable to the editors at that time how someone could pray to their bath, essentially, right? Or how you could pray to your prayers is what he was doing. But of course, that is exactly what he was doing. And so 83 then actually fixes it with a better understanding of the Sanskrit itself that says, Oh, my prayers three times a day, all glory to you. The glory is not in this line going to Krishna, it's going to the prayers. Oh, bathing, I offer my obeisances to you. Again, the obeisances are not to Krishna, but to the bath itself. Okay? Um, other types of errors are introduced due to misunderstandings. Whoops, sorry, wrong one. Which way? Wait. Yeah, oh, sorry, did I? Yeah, okay. Other types of errors are introduced due to misunderstandings of the author's intent and linguistic style. Um, so here's another one that shows up very regularly in, in, the, in our work, in the ERP's work. Um, this, is, this is a very small change that you will see has a major impact. Prabhupada's manuscript says, Krishna consciousness, um, this is uh, what he typed, Krishna consciousness and to act in such modes, one has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. I'll read that again. Krishna consciousness and to act in such modes, one has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. Clearly that needs some editing. So 1972 uh, edition said, to understand Krishna consciousness and action according to the modes, one has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. Now, 
action according to the modes. The modes here, uh, for anyone who reads Gita regularly, mean the three modes of material nature. So to understand Krishna consciousness and action according to the three modes of nature, one has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. What Prabhupada said before, Krishna consciousness and to act in such modes, that is, in modes of Krishna consciousness, and here he's referring to different types of relationships we can have with Krishna. And so the 83 edition said, to understand Krishna consciousness and action according to its modes, that is, the modes of Krishna consciousness, one has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. It's just a single word, but it changes the modes from three modes of material nature to its modes, which means different types of bhakti, entirely shifts the meaning, right? From one uh, to the other. Uh, because to understand action according to the three modes, you don't really need to know your relationship with Krishna. You just have to go to college. <laughs> so, okay, and then, whoops. Um, uh, errors introduced by typists and transcribers. This is, um, uh, again, a very common one. Uh, as I read these, I want you to think about what happened from here to here and see if you can catch it. This is probably one of the most common types of changes or mistakes that we see in critical editing processes in manuscripts. His appearance in his original form is his causes mercy upon the living entities so that they can concentrate upon the Supreme Lord as he is, without any concoction or imagination, as the impersonalist thinks of his forms. Maya or Atma Maya means his causes mercy according to the Vishvakosha Dictionary. 1972 turns that into his appearance in his original eternal form is his causes mercy according to the Vishvakosha Dictionary. There's a lot missing in 72. But why, right? That's the big question in critical editing. You can't just say there's something missing because perhaps the author wanted it deleted. Right? That's a, a, a very po good possibility. So just because something is missing from the original transcript to this one doesn't give you the right to reinstate it automatically. What you have to do is to try to get into the author's and editor's shoes and say, what happened there? And if what happened was inadvertent or intentional but unjustified, now we have a reason to go back. Okay? Just because there's a difference doesn't mean, this is actually something really important to clarify. Just because something is found in the original typed version doesn't mean now that's the truth. Because the author intended for editing to happen and may have intended for, and sometimes Prabhupada made changes after publication. So going back to the pre-published version would be a mistake. What justifies going back to the pre-version is when you can retrace the steps, right? You can see the footprints and you can go, oh, that's why it happened. And this is a good example here. Why did this happen? Can you tell? Yeah. It looks like he read to causeless mercy and then maybe he looked away and when he came back, he saw the other causeless mercy two lines lower and just continued from there. Exactly. Right? This is a classic example of I skip. Um, kids do it all the time when they're reading. They'll read and then they get distracted and then they come back and they come back to the same word they left off on, but it's the same word on another line. And they've missed a whole gap. Scribes do this all the time. This is one of the most common things you see. Uh, when you're looking at manuscripts. Uh, I, I saw it frequently when, in my work with critical editions. So in, in this slideshow, it kind of worked out nicely where causes mercy and causes mercy are on top of each other anyway. But this is, this is so easy. You read here, and then you come back down, and there you have it, right? So now that we have a good reason as to why someone who's otherwise reasonable would do this, well, okay, now you can reinstate that in 1983 which now says, his appearance in his original eternal form is his causeless mercy bestowed upon the living entities so that they can concentrate on the Supreme Lord as he is and not on mental concoctions or imaginations, which the impersonalist wrongly thinks the Lord's forms to be. The word maya or atma maya refers to the Lord's causeless mercy according to the Vishvakosha dictionary. Okay, last, last, uh, last example. Um, 
improvements made by the prior editor that skew the meaning. Okay? Now, this is something that's less benign. Uh, this is where the editor actually intervenes because they've got an objection to something being said. And in this case, this is a, a purport from Bhagavad Gita where the transcription has this whole discussion about how there's only one sun within the universe. And not all the, the, the stars are not all suns. Um, he, Prabhupada says, among the stars, the moon is the chief, and therefore the moon is the presentation of Krishna. It appears, however, from this verse that the moon is one of the stars. Therefore, the stars which twinkle in the, in the stars are also reflected by the sun. The theory that there are many suns within the universe is not accepted by Vedic literature. The sun is one, and the reflection of the sun and moon illuminate similarly the stars. The twinkling stars are not therefore suns, as compared here in the Bhagavad Gita, that the moon is one of the stars. Therefore, the stars are as good as the moon. The Macmillan edition reduces all of that to, among the stars, the moon is the most prominent at night, and thus the moon represents Krishna. Um, so we know that likely what happened was the editor of the 1972 edition um, disagreed with or felt embarrassed by this version of cosmology which goes against what modern science tells us. The reason this is likely, again, this is a guess is not enough. Like you have, to, you have to build a case for every single change. There has to be a good reason. The reason this one is likely is because in a letter, Prabhupada prior to this objected to the same editor who changed a bunch of things in Easy Journey to Other Planets because it didn't quite match his conception of what cosmology should be, right? So this particular editor had a predilection for cleaning things up in this way, and so it was replaced. It was restored in 1983. Okay, we're almost there, okay? Almost there. One last example. The ones that I described to you are the type of thing that a critical editor would do in their sleep, honestly speaking. It's, these are like, if they come a dime a dozen, they show up everywhere in critical ed editing processes. The resolution to them are usually straightforward. They're not major areas of controversy. What critical editors actually get excited about is stuff that's a little more complex, right? That's where you have to use your brain power a bit. And the example that I want to give you is that very famous one of the shift from the blessed Lord to the Supreme Personality of Godhead really quickly, and then I'm happy to answer more questions about any one of these, um, if you like, uh, if, you if you want to know more in depth. Prabhupada's original uh, transcriptions, his dictations, his own typing, all mention, all use the Supreme Personality of God. This is one of Prabhupada's signature phrases um, that's, that's key to capturing the concept of Bhagavan in Gaudiya Vaishnava theology. Um, I, I give a whole section on this in my seminar and Ten years ago on Tattva Sandarbha, right? How the concept of Bhagavan, what that means, is a technical term which is then encapsulated by Srila Prabhupada using this phrase, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada uses it all throughout his original dictations. But the 1972 printed edition actually says, Blessed Lord. And as far as we can tell from exchanges of letters and so on between different editors, it seems that the 1972 editor recommended Blessed Lord as more comprehensible to Srila Prabhupada. Um, this is a phrase that's used in Radha Krishnan's edition of the Bhagavad Gita, which, is, which was very uh, well known and popular at the time. And since that time, it's been used by others as well. It has a certain Christian flavor to it that is very approachable and, ex and understandable for people in the West. So that was, uh, Prabhupada approved. Prabhupada uh, agreed that, okay, this would be more understandable um, when requested by his uh, editors to do that. So it was changed to Blessed Lord, and it was used and quoted. However, Prabhupada was never quite happy with that change. When the abridged edition of the Bhagavad Gita came out, or, or one of the editions in the middle, um, uh, Prabhupada, in, in one, of the mistake, one of the edits or the copy edits that he made himself, he crossed out uh, the Blessed Lord and wrote the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In a lecture that he gave, actually in more than one conversation, 
Prabhupada specifically objects to the blessed Lord. He says, this blessed Lord idea, where is this coming from? He is not the blessed Lord. He is the supreme personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada objects to it publicly, right? And then in 1975, which is still during Prabhupada's lifetime, uh, two years before his departure, 1975 edition of the Bhagavad Gita is published, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead is restored there rather than the Blessed Lord. Okay? So the 72, the original transcripts don't have it. 72 has Blessed Lord. 1975 doesn't have it. It restores the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 19. Um, 83 edition is based on 1972 Macmillan, but makes the change of changing it to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That historical trajectory itself enough was enough convincing to, um, to the editorial review panel to recommend uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But what was the real clincher is, again, the critical editing aspect of it. One of the characteristics of critical editing that set off alarm bells to a scholarly reader is when something, a change introduces inconsistency within the text itself. That's almost always a marker that there was some tampering going on that was undesired. And so if we look at the first instance of Sri Bhagavan Uvacha in Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada in the purport gives this beautiful explanation of the Supreme Personality of God and what that means why this phrase, Supreme Personality of Godhead, is Bhagavan, right? And as he explains the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the translation doesn't even have the word Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the reader is left wondering, why are we talking about something that has nothing to do with the verse itself? The fact that the, the, the purport where Prabhupada chooses to explain that phrase in the translation has a translation that's missing the phrase, that's a red flag. And it creates inconsistency that to the critical reader then says, okay, this change was introduced either late into the game or against the author's wishes. So one a scholar of critical editing um, uh, named, uh, I forget whether it's Tanzel or Bowers, it's in my paper. He, he says, um, he has a very nice quote where he says that when we see changes that the author um, did not accept or accepted under pressure from the publisher, or accepted only grudgingly, such, ch such changes should be reverted by the critical editor to the original when producing a critical edition. Okay? In other words, this is again an example that's well known in scholarship about critical editing. All those citations and scholarly sources and so on are all there in my paper, but I won't bore you with them at this point. Okay, so this is the more complex edition uh, uh, example. Okay, finally, a couple of caveats and cautions. I've been arguing that the editing done by, um, uh, in 1983 by the editors is akin to a process of scholarly editing, right? That's similar to the type of decisions that a critical editor makes. At the same time, I think it's important to state that what 1983 is is not a critical edition of Prabhupada's Gita. Um, there's one very important thing missing, which is the apparatus. In any critical edition, there's this big section at the bottom of every page where every version and every manuscript is marked, and the one that you chose is up on the top so that you have a full record of the various kinds of changes being made. Um, that cr critical apparatus is the heart of a critical edition. It's not present, as we know, in the 1983 edition. It would be twice the size if it were, but it's not there. So it cannot be properly called a critical edition for that reason. That type of work of a critical edition would be invaluable for the future. We've got the materials for it already. There is a three-in-one Bhagavad Gita that puts the three versions, the original transcript, 1972 and 83, side by side, where you can do that comparison. That's the heart of a critical apparatus. There's changes marked by hand on it, on bbtedit.com. The, the, the bones of it are there, but no one's actually created that critical edition. 
given enough time and resources and interest, that would be a very valuable um, uh, um, contribution for the future. Um, what at least can be done in the 83 edition is to provide maybe a publisher's preface. This would be my recommendation. A publisher's preface that describes the process of scholarly editing that went into the creation of the Gita and the principles that underlie such practices. Uh, because the thing that you don't want is, the, is someone just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, and this one, nah, eeny, meeny, my, that's not, that's not how you do it, right? There, as we've been pointing out, there needs to be principles behind it. Whatever those principles are should be articulated clearly to the reader. So a critical edition is something for scholars. It's not meant for mass distribution. No one enjoys reading a critical edition, let's put it that way. It, it's something you refer to when you have questions about the text. For that reason, his, for historical purposes, a critical edition would be valuable. But at the very least, a process of um, a, a description that describes the scholarly editing that took place would be very useful. Um, so there's a couple of ways in which the edited version is, um, the 83 edition is not a critical edition. That's one of them. The other way is that um, uh, the, um, the editors uh, assumed often, some of the editors, not all of them, but some of them assumed that there should be a lot of consistency across different verses and across the entire corpus of Prabhupada's writing, all his books. And one of the things, probably the, one of the ERP's most common instances where we reject changes, um, or we suggest, not reject, but we suggest a modification to them, is typically when the editors are attempting to create consistency and we say, no, there's no real need for consistency. If this word is translated like this in the word for word and like this in the translation and they're different, that's not a bad thing because it shows you different valences of meaning between one and the other. And the fact that Prabhupada translates this word or this verse like this in the Gita and like this in Bhagavatam differently, they also don't need to be made consistent because different meanings in different contexts are great for deeper understanding. So that's, pro that's an assumption that some of the editors held which is not typical for critical editors of works. When instances like those arise, then typically the editorial review panel has been in the habit of marking those and sending those up for adjudication to say, no, we don't think that this was an appropriate change. It needs to be fixed. How many times do we do that sort of thing? From a body of like, okay, let's say 100 changes, usually 95 are probably uh, in one of the obvious categories that I described earlier. They're kind of like, well, this is 95 to 97. Yes, this is obvious. We see what's happening here. We can tell. We can see the footprints that led us here. Um, in, in maybe 3 to 5% of them, we're thinking, I don't know. Uh, these footprints aren't obvious here. Let's talk about this as a group. So we all come together as a group and discuss it. And we debate and debate and discuss. And again, some people are more in favor, some are against. So it's fairly well balanced. And then of those 5%, probably there's, I would say, around 1% or so that we all agree that is unacceptable, or at least some people insist that it's unacceptable. And that goes up higher to a body called the Revisions Adjudication Council, uh, which is meant to make a final decision. It consists of BBT and GBC members who are meant to make a final decision on those. My last point, which is to say, there's more caveats and cautions in my paper, which, which we don't have time to go through here. Oh no, it's giving up at the last moment. Okay. Like this? <laughs> Oh, you were right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's, mudras are important, yeah? Um, okay. So, um, uh, th that's the, the percentage, right? Now, here's the thing that I want to mention in conclusion. This is probably the most important point of the whole presentation. So, if you've been asleep, this is the time to wake up. The reason none of this should keep you up at night the reason this, none of this should be a cause for you to be overly concerned about the integrity of the message. 
Prabhupada was a master teacher, and he repeated his, the points he wanted to make over and over and over again throughout his books and throughout his lectures and his letters and so on. So often, in fact, that people often note this with complaint, that why does Prabhupada keep saying, Mayavadi is this, Mayavadi is that, right? Um, many people have complained about this to me. Prabhupada wanted to make sure that no matter what happened with his books, the message of Krishna consciousness was not lost. In all the changes that we have sent up so far, that 1% that I was talking about, of all of those changes, there are none that would change anyone's understanding of major or minor points about our philosophy. It's the type of thing that would, you would stop and go, hmm, I wouldn't have done it like that. Or, yeah, I think I agree. It's the type of thing that would lead you to pause and to think and to question and to recognize that editing is always a subjective process. There are critical editions produced over the years, variety of editions of the Bible, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the Mahabharata, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and not one of them has escaped controversy. Not one. Usually an institution, a religious institution, picks one version and moves on and says, this is the one we're following. And there's always a group of people that go, hmm, that one or that one, right? This version or that version. There's simply no way to create a critical edition that is free of debate or controversy. Because no matter how many principles and academic standards you follow, there's always a subjective element. Perhaps Prabhupada knew this. Perhaps in his vision as an Acharya, he understood that in the thick minds that we have, and, or I should speak for myself, that I have, and the nature of Kali Yuga, right? Manda Sumanda Mataya, that things are naturally prone to decay. You begin, you remember the first part of my talk today, right? This is a natural process. Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita, Yogo Nashta Parantapa. Things decay over time. In order to prevent that, let's ensure that no one misses the point. And that's the thing that should give us heart. If anyone gets a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, honestly, any version of it, they cannot miss the heart of the message. They cannot fail to become devotees, given enough sincerity. And this is why both versions, or all versions, I should say, because there's been more than two, have produced thousands and thousands of devotees, each one of them, right? So none of the changes that we have done are earth-shattering. Some recover a few really sweet points that were lost. Some lose a point or two that we object to. That's the sort of thing that happens, but nothing that should keep you awake at night. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry this went a little longer. I appreciate it. I want to be respectful of your time, and I know there's a Sunday feast coming and so on. Um, uh, do we have any time for questions, or should we pause, stop here, and then I'm happy to talk individually with devotees? What's the guidance at this point? Uh, because we're right at, or actually we're 15 minutes beyond the time we were scheduled to stop. We'll be here all day, and we'll call the airline for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I have a little bit of time, so maybe we can take, maybe say, 15 minutes? Uh, for a Q&A, uh, and that way we're only 30 minutes over time. Um, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. I wasn't uh, too interested in this topic, but uh, I know whatever you speak is nectar. I just came for you more than the topic, and uh, you presented it so well, and uh, you know, it's like a kind of a 
generally a dry topic, but you made it uh, so relevant and uh, relatable to all of us, and we can appreciate all the effort, uh, you know, goes on in the editorial process, and you know, you helped us develop the respect for the process and our gratitude for all that has gone in. Thank you so much for that um, guidance. One question I had was um, on the change on the Bhagavad Gita 7.2, uh, the numinal versus numinous. Mm. Um, actually, I don't understand either word anyway, but if you can just uh, give a light on that, that would be great. Yes, yes, okay. Um, that's a good question. Let me just say something first about the appreciation that you offered. I, um, I, I too, for years, was not interested in this topic. Um, and um, one thing I've, I've come to realize, just to kind of offer my appreciation to, to all the devotees who have cared for Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, you know, when in a family you've got, you've got a valuable jewel, or you've got um, gold jewelry, often in India, people pass this on, or in the West they, they pass on wedding rings um, from one generation to another. The fact that it's old and ancient and, and comes from your great-great-great-grandfather or grandmother makes it special. But what makes it even more special is that one generation after another has valued and treasured that family heirloom and passed it on to the next generation. That I received this from my mother, who received it from her mother, and so on. And in some ways, if we want to think about this positively, Right? In some ways, that's where we stand, where these books by Srila Prabhupada have been um, published and edited and read carefully and distributed and cared by so many hands over the last, what is it, 50, 60, 70 years, and treasured by so many devotees. And that's something not to be um, upset about, but rather to be proud of the fact that even as the works of the Goswamis have come to us through so many hands, and each one has worn that ring and polished it and, and shined it and, and taken pictures of it, so also these books have passed through the generations and through the hands of so many devotees who have put in so much effort into preserving and distributing and taking care of Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. So I think that should make us very happy and very proud, and it adds to the value of the text to know that so many devotees have held it in their hands, physically or metaphorically speaking, symbolically speaking, and cared for the Gita. So thank you for, for bringing up that appreciation, that point. Um, for myself, being you know, a second generation devotee who you know, have, has, has kind of missed a lot of the early part of Prabhupada's book publishing and editing and so on, I, that's something I'm very grateful for, is to think that so many people before me took such good care with so much sincerity of Prabhupada's books that today I can even have a discussion like this, right? It, it could have been totally impossible to have this discussion today if so many devotees had not taken good care of Prabhupada's books. So that's one thing. On, on, the, on the numinal versus numinous, we discussed this like last month, I think. It's very, very recent. And the, the um, I can't recall right off the top of my head, but numinous and numinal, uh, one of them, I think it's the numinous one, uh, is a very specific term used uh, first, I think, by Rudolf Otto in, 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 in the modern period to refer to an, um, an, uh, an, a conception of the divine that is abstract and impersonal beyond all name and form. And another refers to basically the opposite of phenomenal. I think it's noumenal. That refers to the opposite of phenomenal. And so um, uh, the, the, the word, I think it was numinous, that's incorrect in that situation because it actually refers to the wrong thing, whereas phenomenal is the term that correctly identifies material, phenomenal, versus noumenal, transcendental. So that was the resolution. We had actually a pretty lengthy discussion about it. And afterwards, I'm happy to, to look up the exact words and share. But both words, uh, which are, I agree, both equally difficult to understand, have actually different 
histories and pedigrees, and they mean different things very much, and noumenal is the correct parallel of phenomenal. So, is that okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, Shivas Pandit Pru. Sorry, it's a, uh, I, and, and uh, really it's in the sense of a very critical kind of question that we were discussing about, yes, so forgive yes. me. So you said that Srimad Bhagavata and Bhagavad Gita are very stable, and like Mahabharata is all over the place. But someone might say Bhagavad Gita is part of Mahabharata. So how do you, how can that reconcile those two things? Yes, uh, the the reason is because uh, the the uh, even though the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, for centuries it has been read and transmitted separately from the Mahabharata, right? People. It's not that the only time people read Bhagavad Gita is when they come to that part of the Mahabharata story. In fact, people read the Bhagavad Gita all the time and rarely read, read, I mean, actually read Mahabharata. They may hear the story, they may see it performed, they may watch a movie about it, but they rarely read Mahabharata, unlike Bhagavad Gita. They rarely memorize Mahabharata, unlike Bhagavad Gita. So even though the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, its actual manuscript stability is a world of difference. Bhagavad Gita, if, you know, Prabhupada sometimes has a variant reading. He says, Janma karma chame divyam yo janati tattvata. Have you heard him say that? Yeah? So, evam yo veti tattvata. There's an example of a variant reading. That's an example of a significant variant reading that changes the meaning zero, right? It makes no difference. Evam yoveti tatvata and yo janati tatvata are two verbs for no that in context mean exactly the same thing, right? But there's an example of a variant reading, despite the fact that the Gita is learned and memorized by so many people, right? But the, the point is Bhagavad Gita, those variations are so minuscule like that, and they make so little difference to the meaning that most people don't worry about it at all. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Prabhu. In the, yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Such a wonderful and in-depth conversation that we had today. And then you came with uh, several arguments and put together. And before even going into the topic, you gave enough examples. So that is very convincing. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is, um, we have an episode that uh, Srila Rupa Goswami uh, in the Nectar of Devotion, when he wrote, he gave it for editing to Vallabhabhat from uh, Pushti Mark. And then Jiva Goswami had a conversation with him, and they both were discussing about certain topic. And then because of this, uh, Srila Rupa Goswami has severely chastised Jiva Goswami to the extent that he sent him away from Vrindavan for several years. And he has to be in a in a cave uh, inflicted with crocodiles. And there's a, it's a very severe lesson to all of us. Now, how do we, how do we understand that in connection with today's uh, class? Mm. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, first of all, it's important to note that um, Rupa Goswami didn't give uh, Vallabhacharya, uh, Vallabhata the manuscript for editing. Okay? Uh, we have to be very careful with terminology because the editor of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu was Jiva Goswami. He gave him as a reader for feedback um, and uh, what we might call a peer review today. Please read it and give me feedback about it. And the feedback that he received um, prompted an edit to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. An edit that changed, um, the, the, I, I, I think the phrase was, uh, um, a mukti spriha pishachi, which is the desire for liberation is like a witch. And Vallabhacharya or Vallabhabhatta, sorry, was, was not um, comfortable with the idea of comparing uh, liberation to a witch. And so that was the feedback. And Rupa Goswami accepted that feedback and uh, said he would make a change to Bhakti Rasamta Sindhu. Jiva Goswami didn't feel like the edit was necessary because he felt that that criticism didn't really apply because Rupa Goswami was not comparing liberation to a witch, but only the desire for liberation to a witch. And any desire other than for bhakti is like a witch in the heart. I'm now forgetting exactly how that was resolved, um, but the, um, I think it was, I think it was changed, but the alternate reading was then given in 
Jiva Goswami's commentary. It was preserved there. So I think this gives a very beautiful example of the very close and robust relationship between an author and an and, and editor, right? Where it really is a back and forth in terms of the author saying, yes, I want to make this change, and the editor saying, well, I think this actually conveys your point very clearly, and so forth. And it shows us that Jiva Goswami truly was a trusted editor for Rupa Goswami. Uh, the fact that he even had the capacity, the, the courage, the ability to object to something like that from a senior Vaishnava and say no. Of course, the story has many lessons after that, and I discussed this in my Jiva Goswami seminar, that um, Rupa Goswami teaches an element of respect for Vaishnavas um, through uh, his chastisement of Jiva Goswami. And Jiva Goswami shows how to accept the instruction of the spiritual master upon your head, um, even when you, you, you don't quite agree or accept it by humbly accepting that punishment of leaving. And Sanatana Goswami shows how senior devotee can intervene in a circumstance to help recover things and bring it together. So Prabhupada describes how Everyone, he specifically discusses this story, and he says that Jiva Goswami was acting perfectly by objecting to Vallabha Bhatta's change. He was defending his guru. Um, he was, uh, Rupa Goswami was acting perfectly by teaching how Vaishnava humility to his disciple, and um, Sanatana Goswami was acting perfectly by resolving the situation. Um, okay, yes, Malini Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the, um, <laughs> the topic so close to heart here. Um, and uh, I, I appreciated the fact that you said that all editions are correct, um, uh, whatever editions were made so far. Um, I had a question um, uh, about how to handle situations where um, recently we were distributing books, um, the one that we have currently with BBT, and... Um, and we wanted, to, and and some other devotees said we would like to distribute them as well. And as soon as they saw the books, they said, "Oh, these are not the original versions, so I can't distribute them. I don't want them." So this topic comes up a lot. So I thought um, I will ask you if you had any thoughts to share, Prabhu. Thank yes. You. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful question. And um, this connects to what I said at the very end of my presentation, which is that. Any edition has always been a cause for debate, right? What usually happens, or always happens, is that um, the edition that needs to be used, how is that decided? Typically, that's an institutional decision. As in a religious institution, whether it be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or it be a particular branch of Islam, or it be, be a particular denomination of Christianity, makes a determination institutionally to say, this is the edition that we're going to use, right? Despite the fact that, yes, this, some people object to this and this object to that, that decision is made institutionally because it's the only way to move forward. In other words, when we talk about debate, and as I hopefully I've shown how there's, there's such reasonable sorts of changes made in 83, but so long as we look at the various scholarly sides of the discussion, there will always be debate. I mean to say there's nothing that I can present to you today that will 100% convince everyone about 100% of the changes. Not possible, because some of those changes are subjective decisions. That's the nature of editing. It's, there's no machine that can do editing. There's Grammarly for grammar, but not for editing. Editing is much more of a robust process, and even grammar is subjective in its application, right? So just by the process of thinking this through and arguing, there's never going to be a resolution. A resolution almost always has to come through institution, where the institution says, well, for whatever reasons, here's the history, uh, right? For practical purposes, this is the one we're going to use, this is the one we're going to read in our temples, etc. So it's an exercise of authority. Now, hopefully, that authority is exercised in a transparent way, right? Which is my suggestion, for example, that we lay out very clearly what is the scholarly editing process that has gone on in these. Then when it's transparent, most people can look at it and say, okay, I disagree with this or that, but overall this looks pretty reasonable to me. Okay, I'm happy to read this edition of Bhagavad Gita. So um, two things then. One, it's 
an institutional decision. It's not my decision or your decision. It's an institutional decision. And secondly, then that institutional decision, when it's accompanied by sufficient transparency and clear discussion about the topic or, or, or elaboration, argumentation, then most people can get behind it. But one cannot hope for 100% agreement on every change that's there. So I would just be, in situations like that, I would just be up front, right? Which is to say, ISKCON, its highest body, the GBC, is currently discussing which addition is going to be most appropriate. They've convened a panel for these purposes. And a final decision is forthcoming. In the meantime, we use 1983 edition of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, something like that. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're at 12.30. I think we should... Um, sorry, 1.30. I, I think we should stop at this point um, and individual questions. Uh, also, if anyone would like a full copy of the paper, it's nearly done. I'm putting some finishing touches on it. I've received some good feedback. I've presented it at academic conferences, which has gotten me some good feedback. So I'm incorporating those into... Uh, the version. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, Krishna willing, by mid-January it should be done. If you'd like a full copy of the paper, it's something you're interested in, please feel free to send me an email and uh, or give me your email address and I'll be happy to send it to you uh, in about a month's time when it's done. Okay? Thank you all so much for your attention today. Hare Krishna. To Shiva Prabhupada, to Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Shri Shri Panjatapa, Shri Shri Radha Madan Mohan, Shri Shri Lakshmi Nishengadev, if you so desire, please bring Radhika Raman back to this kind of Silicon Valley again and again. And also, please continue to empower him so he can <coughs> expand Krishna consciousness in the most important way foundationally th through spiritual and deeply. Uh, considered research and high realizations. Thank you very much for considering our request. Om Tat Sat. Radhika Raman Prabhu, we're deeply touched. I was uh, noticing your stamina. I made some off comment about the only thing you couldn't do is play basketball. <laughs> but I got that from your kids. And <laughs> But <clears throat> you're not only... Uh, such a um, solid Vaishnava, but also your presentation skills are amazing on so many levels, not just for their thoughtfulness, but also for the f sheer physical stamina. So we'll, we'll, we'll fill that category back in. You, you are an athlete in your own right. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, who joined us online over the last two days, and for those of you who came in to the live studio audience here at ISV. His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.